Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is uh, Dumitru Chara. I'm here together with my colleague Alesh. Uh, we're part of the core OVN team, Open Virtual Network team in Red Hat. And today, today's talk is not about AI. Um, it's about, it's about uh, OpenShift virtual networking. And we're going to try to have a, a sort of journey from throughout the stack from Kubernetes objects all the way to the network packet pipeline, and then hopefully manage to come back. So let's start with a simple exercise. <laughs> let's say you have a tiny cluster, two nodes, a couple of pods in the cluster. In this example, a client pod and a server pod. And a service, the, clients try, the client tries to access the server via the service. Um, so traffic flows from the client to the service, to the server, and back. Have you ever tried to imagine how the network actually forwards packets in your, for your service in OpenShift? I mean, it seems straightforward, right? There's probably some forwarding rules here and there, um, routes, layer two policies, whatever. Uh, maybe some na maybe some load balancing to select the, the service endpoints that is going to service the traffic, and so on. And now the question is, <laughs> is it really like that? Well, in practice, if you look at the kernel, it's this. Um, so I guess we're done. This is how it works in the <laughs> in the virtual network. No, uh, joke aside. Um, can you actually make out something from, from this dump and uh, figure out what the virtual network is actually doing? So I have a couple of answers here. More answers are possible. So you can choose between awesome, this is great, I don't need more, it's enough. Or you can say it's complicated, it's hard to read, or it's obfuscated, or what's all that? How, how can I manage to figure out anything from here? So if you answered it's awesome, then that's cool. So you can probably skip to the end of the presentation. But I, I'm pretty sure there are quite a few people that would have answered uh, one of the other choices. So what we're going to try to do is um, today with, with our presentation, we're going to try to demystify a bit the networking, so the virtual networking solution. Uh, we'll try to make explicit the link between all the layers in the stack. And we'll do that by showing the tools that uh, may help you to troubleshoot your OpenShift networking um, issues, or maybe to better understand the architecture and potentially its limitations, and maybe even expand the, the design of your virtual network infrastructure, if you're an OVN Cube developer, by, uh, for example. Or, uh, we can also imagine that if you have applications that depend on the network, you might be interested in what the network is actually doing. So how we'll achieve that uh, sort of agenda? We're going to start with a few short, boring definitions. Uh, then we're going to give a, an overview of the current networking solution in OpenShift. And then we're going to do a really deep <laughs> dive into the low-level implementation, and hopefully, don't worry, we'll try to do that. We'll slowly guide you back up the stack. And by the end, uh, we should have connected all the dots uh, in order to be left again with easy to understand abstractions like we had in the first picture. And also, we'll, we'll do a short demo of what the tools are that we, we can use to achieve that. So yeah, should you be interested in this? Uh, I hope so. Uh, I listed here a few reasons why you should be. I'm sure there are more. Um, the last one there, if you like detective work, yeah, that's a good reason to be interested in this, but it might also be a prerequisite because we're going to go quite deep in the stack. So we need to find our way out. Let's start with some uh, definitions. OpenShift, everyone probably knows what that is. I won't define it. OVS, Open vSwitch, is a virtual switch that's used in the data plane. It's, uh, con it can be configured by OpenFlow, so by SDN controllers to OpenFlow. Uh, the SDN controller that the solution uses is uh, 
uh, OVN, Open Virtual Network. And OVN, unlike OVS, doesn't reason in flows, in open flows. It reasons in logical concepts. So router switches, load balancers, you link them together and you get a logical network topology. Uh, OVN has a few important components that I'm going to list here. The central ones, a northbound database, where that basically stores the user-facing network configuration. The southbound database is the internal counterpart. It's our internal representation of the logical network. NorthD is a sort of compiler from northbound to southbound database. And then on each node, there's an SDN controller, OVN controller, that translates the internal representation to OVS flows, to open flows. Um, yeah, and to link this to Kubernetes, to, to OpenShift, we have the CNI, that's OVN Kubernetes. Uh, upstream, it's an OVN community project. And uh, downstream in OpenShift, it's the current default networking solution, or uh, default CNI. Um, yeah, networking. This is how the OpenShift virtual network looks. Actually, a part of it, it's even more. Um, here in this diagram, we see two OpenShift nodes, or two Kubernetes nodes, uh, one on the left, one on the right. And in the current architecture, after OpenShift 4.14, we distributed the OVN control plane that's provisioned by OVN Kubernetes. So on each node, we're going to have uh, a set of northbound, southbound, NordD, OVN cube nodes, uh, OVN controller, OVS, and so on. Uh, in the older architecture, everything was a bit more centralized, and we're not going to discuss about that today because Surya and Patrick did a really good job last year at DevConf presenting that. Um, why did we move between the two? Well, it improved the control plane scalability, so now we distribute the control plane load, and it removed the control plane, the need for additional control plane redundancy in OVN. Because our central source of truth is the Cube API. And there is redundancy there already. And then each node basically runs its own OVN um, cluster, its own OVN deployment. That translates, with the help of OVN Kubernetes, the um, configuration of the Cube API to OVN uh, routers, switches, load balancers, and eventually open flow and in the kernel data path flows. So yeah, some challenge, challenges. It's uh, complex. <laughs> there are a lot of components. Uh, even if you just look at the network, logical network, it's still hard to understand what's going on. But if you go further and you try to make the link between Kubernetes objects, pods, services, routes, whatever, and how packets are processed in the data path, it's, it's hard. It's hard to see that link. The, the thing is we have the tools to figure all that out. So we have tools at all the layers. We have tools to inspect the kernel data path, to inspect uh, OVS open flows, to link them to OVN constructs, and eventually to the Cube API. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to try to connect all the dots between the kernel and the Cube API. Okay, let's, let's start with that. So buckle up, it's gonna be a wild ride and there will be a lot of things going on, but hopefully at the end of this part, you will be able to kind of demangle the things that are going on. So let's start at, at the top. Uh, Let's start with the de definition of the of the Kubernetes API view. So as we said, we have two pods uh, on two nodes. So we have client pod on node one and server pod on node two. In between them, we have a service with some service IP. And what actually happens if the client tries to talk with the server? So the, the client will try to open a TCP connection to the service IP. Uh, which will be translated to the server pod because the server pod is as, as backend for the load balancer. It will arrive to the server, the server will reply something, and we will do the opposite uh, with, that, with that IP. So 
So we will translate the source IP of the, of the server back to the service IP and it will arrive to the client. I think that this is all nice, right? So let's jump down straight to the bottom. Let's start with the kernel view. So this is kind of the, the topology you can say, uh, how the kernel, uh, or how could view the, what is happening from the kernel point of view. So uh, we have, on each node it's basically a mimic, so, so both sides are kind of equal. So we have the pods, the pods are in some kind of pod networking namespace. The namespace is connected with uh, OVS, uh, kernel OVS data path, which is basically OVS module inside the kernel. In parallel, we have a contract inside the kernel, which we use for various things, mainly the, the nothing, load balancing, things like that. And there is a very important thing that connects the two nodes, that's the Geneve tunnel. That's basically how we get the packet from one node to another. And the, the good thing about this is we don't care if the if those two nodes are in the same data center or across the whole world because we have a unified way how to how to deliver the packets across the network. So what does it actually mean? Like when we say kernel flows, we call them kernel flows. Uh, it's basically set of rules that have three important components. The first thing is a match that basically describes uh, what happens if the packet is matching the fields that are specified in, in, in the match. Then we have an action. The action is the, <laughs> as the name suggests, is the action that is happening. So we have various things. We can drop the packet. We can output the packet. Uh, we can change various fields of the packet. We can change IP addresses, MAC addresses, things like that. But for us right now, currently, more, the most important thing is the UFID, uh, which stands for Unique Flow Identifier. This is basically the connection between kernel flows and open flow rules. So the, so the kernel flows usually consist uh, of one or more uh, open flow rules. It's kind of the open flow rules are kind of embedded in, in, inside of the kernel flow. So we have the UFID to identify which open flow rules are doing the, the stuff inside the kernel, basically. And yeah, this is, this is the snippet as, as Dumitru showed. This is just part of the picture. So we have two kernel flow rules that we have dumped from the kernel. And as you can see, there, there is the UFID, the important part for us. There we have a match. And if you take a look at the, at the first flow, the, the green one, we can see that there is a highlighted recirculation ID. This is a important bit because if we, if we see flow with recirculation ID zero, we know that this is the first flow that the packet will hit. And then, then we have uh, other things that the, this flow matches on, like uh, MAC addresses, IPv addresses, things like that. And then we have the action. So we can see for this particular flow, the action is CT, CT NAT. So it will send the packet into the contract inside the kernel in zone 19. It will do the nothing, and then we'll set the recirculation to 49 hex, uh, which is the, important bit because as we can see the second flow is matching on the recirculation ID, uh, ID 49 hex which basically tells you that those two flows are connected and basically once the action is done uh, with that first flow it will just continue with the second flow that has the same recirculation ID and, and we have other things like we can match on CT states and things like that so this is all nice and so from that we might be able to tell more about what is happening right now, but is it really that useful? Uh, I mean, we have other things, right? So let's go one layer above. So this is like kind of the open flow view. So as you can see, it is again mirrored on both sides. It is still connected through the Geneve tunnel between the nodes, but now we have an uh, important component in between. It's the BRIN, that's what we call integration bridge. It's basically OVS bridge that has all the open flow rules installed inside and make, is making the decision and is uh, basically in charge of installing the flows inside to the kernel. And open flow rules are slightly different. They are, they are very similar to the kernel flow rules, but, but have some uh, differences. So for example, we have two new, uh, two new fields 
uh, inside of an open flow rules. We have the table ID and the priority. So in the open flow, we have multiple tables where we can install the flows because it's not always straightforward to do basically some, something in a single flow. So we require more flows and more tables to kind of jump in between them and do all the, all the things that we require to get the packet from one side to another. We have the priority, so inside of a single table, you can specify basically in which order the, the matches will be evaluated and the flows. Uh, and again, we have a match and action. Uh, the, the, the difference between match and action for open flow and the kernel flow is that the open flow matches and actions are more versatile. It, it allows us to explain more things. We have also uh, things co uh, called fields. We, have, uh, the, we can use some general purpose kind of registers. We can store some values specific for us and read them back and things like that. Uh, again, the important part for us is that now we don't have UFID, but instead we have a cookie. Cookie is basically just simple identifier, but OVN is kind of smart enough in this that it leaves us some breadcrumbs in form of the cookie. So we can actually match the cookie to the southbound database uh, UUID and get the things that basically translate into this uh, open flow. So yeah, we can see it uh, in the practice. So we have took the first UFID that, that we had available and we, had, uh, we have the dump UFID rules, which basically collects all the open flow rules that correspond to this kernel, uh, kernel flow and dumps them. So we can see the first one in the green. We have a cookie with some, with some number. And uh, we can see that it corresponds to, to an entity inside of the soundbound database. In this case, it's a port binding. And we can see that, that it, it, it has a column logical port and we have the default client there. So this tells us that this is probably for the client bot. And the same goes for the second flow. Uh, we have a cookie, and again, if we match it to the entity inside the database, we can see that this corresponds to logical flow. And if you take closely, there is a column actions, and the last thing on the actions list is something called CTLB mark, which might hint you that this has something to do with load balancing. And indeed, this is our load balancer that takes care of the, of the Kubernetes service. Uh, one thing to note, the, the dump UFID rules is not upstream yet. So if you would like to play with that, uh, you would need to get the patch that is uh, pending. But other than that, yeah, let's get moving. So now we have the OVN view. And, and you can see that it has changed quite a bit, like from the from the kernel view and uh, open flow view. But this is getting more similar to what Dimitri showed, right? Showed, right? It is just a shortened image because we didn't want to show all the components, but only the important ones. But, but you can see we still have our client pod and we still have our uh, server pod both sitting on different nodes. Uh, the important thing is that now in OVN we de describe things like uh, in components that resemble something that is more like real life, so switches, routers. So we have uh, node switches that basically connect into a cluster routers. And you can see inside of the node one, we have the load balancer, which is our service that is connected to the node switch. So that's basically doing the translation uh, of the service IP to the backend IP. Important piece is the OVN cluster router. So you might wonder why do we actually need some router in between. Well, it makes a very, very important decision. So basically, whenever you do some traffic, we need to decide if that traffic is external. So it, if it is going outside of the cluster, or in other words, north-south traffic, or if it's just traffic between two nodes, uh, in other words, east-west traffic. And in this case, this is indeed a cluster, uh, it, this is traffic that is going inside of the cluster, so the cluster router will just uh, route it towards the transit switch. The transit switch uh, represents basically the Gini tunnel. This is how we describe that 
uh, one node is tunneled to the other. And again, if we go again one, one uh, step further, we can map out southbound representation, which again is basically the internal representation of OVN of all the components that we have that was translated by the OVN not C. And we can take them and we can see that for the port binding, it's really easy. We have the name right there, so we can just see the default client corresponds to the northbound database logical switch port, which is basically the representation of the of the port. That is what is basically written by the OVN Kubernetes to, to create that port in the topology. And for the logical flow, we have something called stage hint. This is basically for us to be able to track it back up again. And the stage hint corresponds to the load balancer, uh, which you can see it has the service IP that is translating to the to the server port, which is the backend IP. Uh, one thing that is important, you can see there is an external IDs column, and you can see there we have basically the description of what it has. We have the KAS, uh, OVN org, and this service. So this is actually our service that was created by the OVN Kubernetes inside of the Northbound database. Right, so, so that was a lot of information, I can imagine. So let's try to connect it uh, together in, in one picture. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we have some packets. Uh, in this case, it is the packet from the client. It has some some attribute. It has the MAC addresses, IP addresses, ports. Then we have the kernel flow. So you can see the kernel flow is matching on, on that packet. Uh, so the important thing from the kernel flow is the UFID. So if we take the UFID and uh, get all the open flows, we can get, in this in this example, we, we can get the uh, load balancer open flow rule and we can see again here important is the cookie so if we take the cookie we can translate it into the southbound database from the southbound database we can get the stage hint translate it into the northbound database from the external IDs we can translate it to the service so that's basically the whole way up from the kernel uh, kind of from the packet right all right so we have the dots together. Uh, so why is it useful? Why so many steps? Well, if we, if we have so many steps, we can do some optimizations along the way. So starting from the bottom, if we have, if we have kernel, the flows installed in the kernel are highly optimized. There are things that, that were like kind of tossed out and, and uh, added so, so it, basically exactly describes what we want to do with that certain packet and that is in installed inside the kernel so it doesn't have to traverse between the kernel space and the user space and we can do a lot of packets very quickly, right? We, we can have a pretty big throughput. The OVS, uh, yeah, OVS can be imagined a little bit like an assembly language uh, in networking. So OVS with the open flows we are able to describe more things. It is more versatile, but it is still kind of clunky. If you would like to describe the whole network just with OVS, it would take a lot of time. So that's why we have OVN, and OVN does the, does the abstraction around that. So we have all those components that people are familiar with. We have the routers, uh, logical switches, ports, things like that. And if you if you map this topology into the OVS, it will fly nicely together. And, and on top of that, we have the, the Kubernetes or OVN Kubernetes that basically, once again, translates the, the Cube API requirements into the OVN. All right, so uh, we have prepared a short demo, so I'll try to present it. Let's see. Yeah, it seems to work. So yeah, we, uh, we have a small deployment with, with three nodes and two workers. I, I hope you can see that. I'm, uh, I'm afraid that I cannot enlarge the font because it's pre-recorded, so hopefully it is visible. And the goal of this demo is basically to show the external traffic. So here there is just uh, another container starting. Uh, that basically is running alongside those uh, three already running containers for the 
uh, for the nodes. Yeah, just grabbing the IP address of the container so we can just uh, then describe it inside of the client. Yeah, starting the server. So it is just basic netcat that will listen for incoming connection on port 80. And this is the client. So we have added the, the IP address that I have grabbed earlier. And the client is just sending periodic traffic to, to the server so I can demonstrate what is happening. And you can see indeed the client is up and running. So now we take a look at the TCP down basically. So we will start at the client side. So you can see that the client is sending some TCP traffic towards the IP address that was specified. And this is on the node and I would like to pause it and, and highlight one thing. I hope you can see that, but the source IP has changed between the pod and between the node. The reason for that is that if the traffic is external and is heading outside of the cluster, it gets as nutted to the cluster IP. So continuing, we will, uh, the next thing should be the server side. And indeed we can see that it arrives safely to the, to the server side. So, so let's do a little bit of the exercise that I have described. So let's look at the flows. So we have the flows. I will just pause it for a second. Uh, I did the pre-filtering of the flows because as you can see on one of the previous slides from the beginning, there can be a lot of flows. So I did the pre-filtering and sorting and we will pick two, two flows to show you some, some highlight uh, from, the, from, the, from the whole path. So the first flow we will, we will pick is the actually the NAT. And as you can see, uh, we have the dump UFID rules, so we get all the open flows, and we have another useful tool that is called OVND trace. OVND trace basically does what I have described with the cookie matching, southbound database, and northbound database matching for us. So we can see that we already have for each line that is starting with the cookie, which is the open flow, we already have the logical data path and order description. And if you take a look, uh, the the last line before the command prompt is the NAT. So it basically shows us this is the SNAT that is doing the translation for the traffic outside to the, to the node IP. And there's one more thing I would like to show. So basically, if traffic goes outside, so we have, this is a lot of flows. <laughs> and the last one is basically, you can see it ends with output one. Uh, it basically means it is outputting the port number one. And as you can see also here, there is that external OVN worker, which means that the traffic is heading outside of the cluster. That should be it for the demo. So I think Salish for doing the hard work. <laughs> um, yeah, um, it's not easy to debug networking. It's probably complex and it might look scary at first, but I think that with the right tools it can become more readable and maybe easier to understand. So yeah, the conclusion we reached is that there are no real mysteries in networking. It's, it works for a reason. Um, and uh, I think we successfully managed to link all the layers between abstractions. Uh, at Kubernetes level, kernel level, OVN level, OVS level. So from highly optimized flows to OVN routers and switches and Kubernetes objects. Uh, what we saw in the demo and in the slides were the tools that you can already use. Yeah, okay, there is a patch that needs to land, but that should be fine. Um, and if you use those tools, you probably will be able to debug your own network at very low level if you want to. And I think that the, the most important thing is when, when you're in doubt, when you're trying to figure out where packets go, just remember this link. Go check the UFIDs in the kernel, use the tools to figure out the corresponding open flow cookies, and then go to OVN, look at stage hints, external IDs, and you'll probably get the link back to the Cube API. So yeah, that's it on our side. Um, do you guys have questions?
So can you repeat? I. Um. Well. Yes. I mean. Yes. Oh yeah. Sorry. I need to repeat the question. Is it possible to to implement direct service server return uh, with OVN? I, I think so. Uh, OVN is quite flexible. You can install policies. You can, um, yeah, I guess you could. Uh, it's not really an open shift question, I guess. And uh, if you come up with a network configuration that does that in real life, it probably will work with OVN. We try to mimic real routers, real switches. So I think you should. Okay, so Dan replied uh, that in Kubernetes you already have that. I didn't know about ETP local. Okay. Any other questions? So I'll repeat the question. Uh, Miguel asked if that's always the uh, the relation. If you always find uh, a stage hint in the southbound database that links to the northbound database, not really. Uh, stage hints are for logical flows, but for all uh, northbound database um, records, there are ways to. So, sorry for all northbound database records, there are hints in the southbound to get back to them. We only, we only spoke about the stage hints, but yeah. For example, load balancers in a northbound have a southbound counterpart. So there it's kind of easy because you use the name as linked. But in other cases, it's possible to. Any other questions? seem like it. So okay. thank you all for your thank attention. You.